And I get back there and the guy says, uh, can you do two more? And I thought he was joking. He's like, oh yeah, sure, I feel great. I can do two more. He goes, no, I'm serious. Can you do two more? My legs are shot. So I ended up going the last two miles. And... Welcome to the 296th episode of the Jamie Delaney Plant-Based Wellness Podcast. My name is Jamie Delaney and I'm your host. I'm a plant-based cardiologist and endurance athlete living in Southwest Florida. Thanks for listening. So that was Tom Montgomery. He's one of our members of our practice as well that just completed a double Ironman or what's called uh, now the Anvil Race, uh, which is the equivalent of two full Ironman uh, races. He did it as relay relay team uh, with three members. And he's going to tell you his story. Um, their combined age on the team was of uh, three people, 207. So they call themselves TC, CTC 207. And an Ironman, a double Ironman or an anvil race is basically two times the swim, 4.8 miles, a 224-mile bike ride, and a 52.4-mile run that they split up between the three of them. So you're going to hear his story. And I think... What you're going to find that's special about today's interview with with Tom is that he was kind of always a guy that did the right thing. He um, wrestled in high school. He started running, and he did triathlon all through the 80s, and he was never overweight. He never smoked. He, you know, he, he was the good all-American guy, ate within his realms. Again, his weight was really good. Um, but he started having chest pain one day after uh, during a bike ride in Claremont up a big hill that ultimately led to a heart catheterization and a stent placement. So he could have had the stent and just hung up his shoes and his goggles and said, that's it, this doesn't work. But he and his wife looked to what they could do to make things a little bit better. How could they change their life to make things better? And he adopted a plant-based lifestyle. And he went back to training for triathlon and has since done um, an Ironman solo, multiple um, Olympic distance races, runs, and now this anvil race that he just completed. So I think you'll enjoy hearing from somebody that, uh, you know, might have just had a bad deck of cards. So, you know, he uh, carries a genetic marker that uh, increases your risk for premature coronary artery disease. No doubt has that. Cholesterol was never really high, probably some inflammation. Uh, But he had an event despite doing what he thought was the best. But, you know, when something happens to us, We kind of have to, you know, you can either be a victim or it's like, what can I do to make this challenge better? You know, how can I ultimately look back and say, you know what, I readjusted and went on and and things were actually okay. And so I think this gives you hope. If you've had a blow to your health that you didn't see coming or you thought was uh, something perhaps you didn't observe, you know, a cancer at a young age or a heart attack at a young age that you really didn't think that um, gee, you know, a lot of people are worse off than I am. Why did it happen to me? This is another way of looking at it. What can you do to make things better? Get back on the bike, put your shoes back on, put your goggles down, and, and let's get moving. We're also going to talk about that risk factor for premature cardiovascular disease, LP little a. And, you know, like I've talked about before on this podcast, sometimes we have genetic markers that put us at risk, but what can we do to not turn on those genes perhaps or not make them as dangerous so we're going to talk about lp little a and what's out there to treat it and what your options are and uh you know maybe help you to decide what you'd like to do about your genetic markers so enjoy this podcast with tom montgomery well i'd like to welcome tom montgomery to the podcast this evening um you know, this is a plant-based wellness podcast, and Tom is both of those. Uh, Tom just completed an anvil, uh, what we would call formerly a double Ironman, but a double triathlon. So, and and Tom is one of our members who uh, is a proud owner of a stent. And if you look at Tom, you would say this is a, you know, a very uh, in the top 90th percentile looking uh, age group, 66 year old athletes. You would never think in a million years if you put you in the lineup that you would possess a stent. And we talk a lot about on on this podcast that, 
you know, you can't really outrun or out uh, outswim cardiovascular disease entirely. It's got to be a multifaceted approach. And, you know, you've done just that. So first of all, congratulations on completing um, this double event. And you did it as part of a relay with a team called CTC 207. So first of all, tell us what a double Ironman is and welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Well, yeah, double Ironman is, is uh, twice the standard Ironman distance, which the standard is a uh, 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and a 26.2 mile run, a full marathon. So a double is twice that. It's a uh, 4.8 mile swim, 224 miles on the bike, and 52.4 mile run. Um, this particular event started in, uh, I think it was 1989 or so in Alabama and uh, moved to Virginia in the uh, late 90s. And they first had the event in Florida in 2011. Uh, currently, it's only held in three states, Florida, Virginia, and Oregon. Uh, it's been here in Claremont since 2016. And I, I first saw it when I moved in Tampa. I was out uh, at a park where they were holding it. And it was a loop course, seven miles. And these people just kept riding around and around and around. And, I couldn't figure out what was going on. So I asked some folks about it and they explained what it was. And I just thought they were all crazy. And that's the last I thought about it. So I moved up here to Claremont and uh, they have it up here every March. And so I was asked to, uh, to join a team by one of our club team members. Um, I'm a member of the Claremont Tri Club. And that's where the name of the team comes from, CTC being the Claremont Tri Club and the 207 is the total uh, summation of our ages. And that ranges <laughs> from uh, 62 to 78. And wow. uh, our oldest team member, 78 year old, uh, is quite, quite an athlete. Uh, he was an all American in 2018 and 2019 and was ranked first in the uh, USA, United States uh, Triathlon Association rankings uh, in his age group for aqua bike. Uh, so he's, he's quite the athlete, amazing. And I was kind of honored that he even asked me to join a team with him, <laughs> but uh, he did. And at first I, I was hesitant, but I finally agreed to do it. And um, so we, we put this team together. Originally, we had a, a woman from Canada as part of the team. And we started out as team CTC 209. But because of COVID and travel restrictions, we had to replace her with someone else that happened to be two years younger. So our team went down to 207. But uh, <laughs> Still the uh, old, older team out there uh, by far. Uh, we were about 70 years older than the next oldest team. Uh, <laughs> age, so, um, <laughs> pretty tough to give away that kind of uh, age advantage, but uh, we, we held our own. So um, that's where the team came from and, and what it was made up of. Um, we kind of thought this was going to be quite a challenge and it turned out to be, we estimated that probably about 27 hours of effort, around nine hours for each of us. And uh, that's obviously a lot less than a full Ironman individually, but it's a lot more than a half as well. So it's kind of somewhere between a half and a full. But the difference being is that it's not all continuous. It's uh, broken up as you hand off the relay to someone else. So um, we broke up the swim and the bike and the run to give each of us a fairly good rest period between each effort. So we all had uh, two to three hour rest periods uh, between definitely on the bike because we took a, about a 30 mile uh, ride on the bike each time someone went out, they did about 30 miles. Uh, the interesting thing about this as compared to most Ironman or even half iron courses is that it's a very short course. So it's very repetitive. So the swim was four tenths of a mile each lap. So it would take 12 laps to complete the swim. The bike was six miles for each lap. So it took 37 laps uh, on the bike to complete the bike distance. And the run was uh, just a little over a mile. So it took 52 laps to complete the run distance. And, and that, uh, made it a little bit different from what you typically have like a either a three loop or two loop or a single loop course in Ironman. Um, this was very repetitive. So it brought in a real, another aspect, the mental aspect of the repetitiveness of the course. You just 
kind of a you know mouse on a treadmill kind of going back out and in and in and out and in and out. Uh, so that that added to it. That along with the the overnight aspect of it um, was something I had never experienced before. Uh, once the race starts, which was at uh, a little after seven o'clock on Friday morning, it runs continuous and the, the double iron or the double anvil event has a, a cutoff of 36 hours. So you'd have until Saturday night at 7 p.m. to finish it. And uh, there are some people that, that, that took almost that long uh, to finish it, the individuals, all the teams uh, I think were under 30 hours. Uh, we, we actually beat our estimated 27 hours and uh, came in in 25 hours and 49 minutes. And uh, that was, uh, as I said, faster than what we had anticipated. And we were only uh, 26 minutes behind the first place team coming in second in, among the teams. And we were 14 minutes ahead of the third place team. So it was pretty competitive to the end. Uh, with those running laps at the end, you know, through the middle of the night, uh, up through sunrise, and it was kind of close to on who was going to do it, and you know, lap times were going down somewhat. Uh, so it was it was interesting, and that, and that was a fun aspect of it. Uh, and the whole event, that's one of the hallmarks of of the Anvil series, is that they uh, have a very family oriented uh, atmosphere. Uh, they create what they call the An Village, uh, an Anvil Village combined. And that's uh, basically was two rows of tents, one on each side of part of the course, kind of the transition area. And every athlete or every team had a tent set up and that's where their support people would be. And, and so because of the repetitive nature of the course, on the bike, you'd come through every six miles and you could replenish your drinks or get food, whatever you wanted to do, or trade off if you're on a relay team. Uh, and the same thing with the run, every mile, you'd be able to come in and, and get some hydration or nutrition, depending on what you needed. So that um, was also where all the sport people were. And throughout the night, they kind of started to get to know each other <laughs> because they're just hanging out, uh, supporting their, their athletes and have a lot of time to spend just chatting with the other groups. And uh, it really creates for a lot of uh, camaraderie among the uh, both the support people and the athletes. Uh, we had met a, a guy that, Originally, he was going to do the single amble. Um, while we were training at Lake Louisa State Park in Claremont, where this race was held, we'd be out there two or three times a week training. And, and this guy was out there almost as much as we were, even though he lived in Orlando. He would drive over and train at the park. And about a month before the race, he switched from the single to the double. And uh, I was shocked that he was going to do that, but uh, it was good. And he actually finished. He, he, uh, was 34 hours and something, I think. So he wow. did fairly well for a single. Um, and, and his tent was right next to ours. So we had a lot of interaction with his support team and whatnot. And that uh, made the race fun and made it easier to stay awake through the night. <laughs> so I think so, overall, I had about uh, three hours good rest with my feet up uh, during one of the uh, bike legs that someone else had taken. And then about an hour of sleep between a couple of my run legs I just kind of went in my car to get warm and because it was kind of cold and damp it was in the 50s and I, I nodded off I'd set my uh, my alarm on my phone to make sure I was up before the next time I had to go out and uh, I just kind of lost track of where I was and had a pretty good power nap for a while there which helped a lot so all in all the race was a, a good experience um, a lot different than a individually run race Ironman or half Ironman uh, but uh, I would you know think about doing one again if I can convince my wife to support me for that <laughs> <laughs> I've met your wife she probably will <laughs> so I'm not sure so, <laughs> so when you did the one mile the one mile run loops um, how many would you do at a time before you switched off and how many people were on the team it was a three-person team so uh, we, we had this really elaborate spreadsheet set up on uh, who was doing what and how many loops and what the anticipated completion times were that we were tracking. Uh, so that way you would know when you were up next uh, and we would update it 
with real, uh, you know, live time information as far as uh, if we were ahead of schedule or behind schedule. And uh, so that helped a lot. And we knew going in that it was probably going to be pretty likely that uh, we may have to change on the run because someone uh, on the fly, I mean, not necessarily during the run, but uh, if someone was not feeling up to it and wanted to cut back on their loops or uh, had to take a break early, and, and that actually occurred um, here, um, was starting to feel a little bit on the bike. And, and he was doing um, the majority of the biking because he doesn't run much. His knees aren't too good for the running. So, uh, he, but he was actually starting to feel on the bike. So uh, our other team member took a couple of his laps on the bike, which ended up making his legs go a little bit more. And so I took a couple of his laps <laughs> on the run and I ended up uh, actually doing a full marathon uh, wow. between the hours of 11 p.m. and, <laughs> and, 10, and 9 a.m. So I did the last two miles and I didn't know I was going to do those last two miles until after I got back to what I thought was my last uh, uh time out there and I mentally it was like okay I just gotta get back and I'm done and I get back there and the guy <laughs> says uh can you do two more and I thought he was joking it's like <laughs> oh yeah sure I feel great I can do two more he goes no I'm serious <laughs> can you do two more <laughs> my legs are shot so I ended up doing the last two miles and uh, all in all it worked out good we, we worked together I think the team gelled pretty well and um, had a lot of fun yeah that sounds great yeah I mean you know, on any run, it's it's so funny. If you're going to go for a a, a ten mile run, and you know somebody says do fifteen, it's like oh. But if you're going for a fifteen and you do ten miles, it's like oh, that's not so bad. You know, I mean, so mentally, you know, the extra two miles, especially at the end when you think you're done, I mean, that is just like you know, you, you really had to dig deep to kind of pull yourself. You know, it's like oh, I can't put my shoes back on, right? <laughs> Yeah, that, really, it was, uh, it was like that. So yeah, we had broken up. I had uh, started with 10 mile and then I uh, was planning to do an eight mile run after that. But the, uh, the other guy was running a lot as well. After his 10 mile, he said he couldn't do an eight and he wanted to cut it down to four. So we started trading off doing four and four. But then my, what I thought was gonna be my last interval was supposed to be six. And I didn't wanna have to do a four, four and then go up to a six. Right. So I, after my first four, I said, let's change it and do a, do a five and I'll do another five. And that worked <laughs> out, except for the extra two at the end, which I hadn't counted on, but uh, uh, one was had by all. <laughs> yeah, that's that sounds good. Well, you I mean, there's something I've only done one relay, but we uh, I did a relay marathon and it was just great fun because you know you just you there's such camaraderie and cheering i guess i did a triathlon too uh, i did an olympic triathlon that was a, a replay that was that was a lot of fun but same thing happened to us with the marathon um it was actually going to be a couple of the people's first marathon and we really hadn't met to talk about it and the week before the marathon addy was addy was part of our team and she was doing hurdles at the time in high school so she was only going to run I think three miles at the end and I was supposed to run the longest one because I was the long runner and I pulled my Achilles and the other two people had colds or something. I mean, it was just like, so we were like a walking wounded and, you know, literally Addie ended up doing the eight mile run and I ended up doing the three or four mile run. And, you know, it was, it was, uh, but we, we had a great time, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, again, you surprise yourself what you can do or you can, you know, you can do and uh, pull it off. It's, it's, it's great fun. Yeah. That's how did you break the this? The sun was up, made it easier to run. Uh, the yeah, extra miles. I mean, <laughs> that, yeah, the, the dark is, you know, I mean, I, anything, I, I guess it's from, you know, staying up all night and during residency, I, I hate the hours between like midnight and three, you know, after three, I'm good to go again, but midnight to three is a really rough time for me. So I, I, you know, that'd be a struggle to, you know, keep that moving. Somebody have yeah. to change my watch for me. <laughs> <laughs> so you also uh, completed, um, we've completed a lot of different Ironmans and, uh, but your last, your last full was Ironman Chattanooga. Yes, right? that's right. Along with you. And, yep. So we all did Chattanooga together and, you know, that was, that was kind of your comeback Ironman, right? After your stent, you know, to go into a little bit of your cardiac history. Um, 
Well, when did you st- you started doing? You started doing. You were you, you were a a wrestler in high school, and then when did you start doing? Come back and start doing running and triathlon. How old were you? I didn't start really running for fitness until uh, col- after, right after college, so 1977. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did my first marathon in '81. Uh, my first multi-sport event was actually in '82, and it was a team triathlon. Uh, that involved uh, running, cycling, and canoeing. Oh, so wow. it was kind of interesting. That was in Louisiana. Uh, and then that was, uh, that was it, except well, I did some swim runs in the early 80s, but I didn't do my first actual swim bike run conventional triathlon until 1989. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my first Olympic was in 92 at St. Anthony's here in Florida. Um, and I just kept doing a lot of sprints and Olympics up until uh, my first half was when I turned 50 in 2004, first half distance event. And then my first Ironman was uh, in 2008 when I was 54. Um, and then for my uh, 60th birthday, I did another Ironman in 2014. And uh, 2015, I. I, I've been doing cycling throughout this whole time, and uh, but I've never ridden across the state. So in 2015, I did the cross Florida one day, 170 mile ride, and that was a lot of fun. Um, we start on the east coast at sunrise, and you're supposed to get to the west coast by sunset, kind of a thing. And, and that's a little challenging that? because the, the hills are on the uh, west side of the state. Uh, well, after you come through the Claremont area, it's pretty flat again until you get to. Uh, Hernando, Pasco Hernando area, and it gets hilly again right at the end. So you really feel it at that time. Uh, so that was 2015. I was in pretty good shape all the way up through then. Um, and then in uh, the end of 16, I had a physical and everything was good uh, until I was out on my bike in December of that year, 2016. And I was climbing one of our local hills here in Claremont, which is uh, when people hear about hills in Florida, they don't think too much about it, but in Claremont, we actually have some, some real hills. And uh, anyway, I, I experienced really severe chest pains and felt kind of sick and sweaty and uh, got off my bike and just kind of hung out on the side of the road for a while until it passed and uh, got back on the bike and rode home. Um, and then I didn't do anything about it because I was in the middle of uh, working out details for a uh, fairly significant outpatient procedure that was scheduled for the first week of January of 17. Um, And it was during that procedure when I was under anesthesia that I had really severe arrhythmia. And uh, after that procedure, they said, they recommended I go over to the cardiac observation unit. And I did and and became an inpatient (laughs) as opposed to being there just for the outpatient procedure. Uh, so then, you know, they, they ran all the tests and everything, including a stress test, and they recommended that I have a catheterization, and uh, they did that and found a, a 95% blockage in my LAD, and they placed the stent in that. Uh, so that's how I got to where I am now with a piece of hardware in me. Yeah, so for, for people out there, uh, left LAD is the left anterior descending coronary that goes down the front side of the heart. So it supplies, you know, um, probably 60% of the heart muscle. Um, you know, it's it's a lot more than just a little vessel. It's one of the, it's the biggie. So if that one goes away, then most of the time people have significant heart damage. So it's definitely one that you wanted to keep open. Um, had you not been in such good shape uh, up that hill, you know, it might have might have been might have been different. But you know, just to that's reiterate. exactly what they told me uh, when I was in for this. They because uh, I gave them you know what was going on, and uh, I did have chest pains in December, and uh, and they said, well, you were probably lucky to have gotten home. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that that's one of those things that you know people. Uh, go down on the golf course or go down in the yard over type of thing, you know, on a, you know, can be, but I would guess that, you know, you had probably because of your training, what we would call a lot of collaterals, you know, so a lot of little blood vessels that were supplying blood all around it. So you had to have a pretty big stressor on that hill to actually get to the point of, you know, bringing it to your attention, so to speak. And, 
you know, whether the plaque cracked or, you know, there was a bit of a clot there that got worse and then you had your procedure. And of course, anesthesia, your blood pressure can change, your heart rate can change, and it's a stressor as well. And that because there was probably, you know, somewhat of a decrease, there was decreased blood flow at the time. That's why you start having the irregular heartbeats. And, you know, it was brought to the attention of, you know, anesthesia. Again, you know, had you not been in good shape, um, you know, you might have been much more prone to having a full clot and a, and a, and a heart attack. And, 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 you know, again, you're here, you are, you're in, in good shape. And at the time when they did the workup, your cholesterol wasn't, uh, I don't think we, when we looked, when I met you, we looked, I don't think you ever had a cholesterol probably much over, I don't even think you hit 200. You were always in the 190, 200 range, if I'm correct. Uh, actually, I was in the 170 range um, from 2011 through 2016, uh, where, when I had that last uh, workup done uh, in you know, October of 16, I guess it was. Uh, I have been averaging 170 and around 90, no 90s for LDL, 170 total uh -huh. and LDL in the 90s. So, you know, like I said, I, I kept being told to just keep doing what I'm doing because all the numbers look good. Mm -hmm. and, and no high blood pressure, no diabetes, and you didn't smoke. So you didn't have any of the boxes checked. Well, I did have a blood pressure concern. Uh, I, was, I was on... Um, a very low dose of some kind of a blood pressure medication. Um, and that had been probably for about, I don't know, three or four years prior to that. Mm -hmm. But still not the, you know, not the guy that we would expect um, to, to have that other than it. So at that 2016, that put you in your 61? Yeah, 61, 62, 60, yeah. 62. Yeah, 62. So, other than, you know, 65% of people in their 60s have some vascular disease, you know, and you're reading the standard American diet then, but. You well, know, actually for, not completely. Not uh, we had been slowly transitioning to uh, what we thought was a healthier diet, sort of Mediterranean lean. Um, one of my daughters had given me a, uh, in 20, whenever it came out, 2015, I think it might have come out. Uh, the uh, Blue Zones book, I uh -huh. think it escapes me right now, but uh, Dan Buettner's book, I th Blue Zone Solution, I think it was called. Anyway, uh -huh. yeah, that's Blue Zone Solution. And uh, we, we were starting to uh, take that a little serious. My wife and I were uh, having meatless meals probably twice a week and trying to uh, move toward uh, that style of eating, uh, but still very heavy in added oil for sure. I, I really used to love uh, uh, bread and dip in olive oil, <laughs> and it seemed like that you know that was okay at the time. Um, and then um, around that same time frame, I watched the Forks Over Knives movie, but thought that was a bit extreme considering that uh, we weren't really having any uh, cardiac issues and, and didn't need to. Uh, go to that extent, we thought at the time, and if we were starting to move toward this blue zone uh, type of diet, we thought we were doing very well. So uh, not completely the standard American diet, but uh, certainly uh, years before that, we, we were certainly standard American diet for a long time. Um, Again, you know, not, um, standard American diet, but not really, if you look at the numbers, not so terrible, you know, like you say, a little bit of high blood pressure controlled with medication, cholesterol. Okay. Um, family history. Um, yeah, well, my father had a heart attack at age 67. Okay. So that's, uh, but my mother lived to 92, I guess it was. So, mm -hmm. you know, only on one side of the family was there, uh, some history of, of that. So, so when you and I met, it was, you know, more along the lines of this is um, somewhat inflammatory. And one of the things that we did was a Boston Heart, which looked at um, some of the breakdown um, lipoproteins and, and genetic risk factors, as well as homocysteine and your, uh, your uh, omega-3, omega-6 profile. 
And what we came upon was that your LP little a was very elevated. So over 50 was considered abnormal. Uh, you were in the 80s, 81, I believe, um, 87. So, you know, we, I guess we identified what we all knew that you had is you had heart disease at a young age and uh, LP little a was a genetic marker for pre you know, early heart disease. So yeah, that was a pretty good predictor that, you know, you, you did have um, a, a risk. And for people that, you know, LP little a is a sign of having uh, cholesterol that, uh, or LDL cholesterol in particular, that is um, more tiny particles, more particles that can slip under the rug, so to speak, so that it can get under your endothelial cell a little bit um, easier and uh, tend to drag with it a lot of inflammation. So, you know, again, had you not been an athlete, um, this, you, you know, you might've had your heart attack in the, or you might've had your, you know, diagnosis in your fifties, but, you know, doing what you're, you, you know, you did, you, you actually, you know, delayed it somewhat. And the question is, you know, okay, so what do we do about it? Your cholesterol is not elevated. Um, your blood pressure is not really elevated. You're exercising like we love everybody to exercise and your weight is excellent. You're, you're lean. Um, what can you do about it? And, you know, there are some, some things out there that when we look at numbers, is there a reason to do something? And a lot of studies, you know, there, there have been some um, plant-based nutrition has been shown to decrease LP little a in some people, some. Um, the medicines like that we people have used early on for high triglycerides and low HDL niacin has been shown to perhaps decrease LP little a a little bit. But the reason why we don't use niacin is it typically increases people's risk for diabetes and liver disease. So that's not a really good option. And then some of the injectable drugs, um, PSK8 uh, inhibitors have been shown to decrease that number in some people um, somewhat, but there's never been a study that has shown that decreasing that number changes uh, any risk factors. So they've never shown drop, in it, those people that have taken those medicines have not shown a decreased incidence of heart disease or heart incidence, cardiovascular incidence compared to people not taking them. So there's always more to the story than just the number or the cholesterol. And you know, even even as much as the statin therapy, where we all, you know, we all anybody that has a heart attack, it's, you know, it's kind of malpractice not to try somebody on a statin to try to drive the cholesterol as low as we possibly can. There's actually been some studies that showing that putting somebody on a statin that has an elevated LP little a can actually cause more events than had they not been on the statin. So, you know, it, it keeps coming back to treating numbers and not people is not necessarily the way to go. When we treat people with a statin therapy that you know just across the board that have high cholesterol, we decrease someone's ability, the liver's ability to make cholesterol. But if they're still eating an animal-based diet, then they can still oxidize or oils, they can still oxidize and have inflammation enough to um, either drive the cholesterol they take in or the plant fats or any other kind of fats that they take in and, and make cholesterol that are, you know, very dangerous. So statins only go so far. PSK8s, we know only go so far. Even when we drive people's cholesterol down into the low 100s, you know, and those are including people that have LP little a, they still have events. We don't get rid of all the events. The only thing we've done for sure across the board. And unfortunately, Dr. Esselstyn's population of 100, they did a 25 and they did 100, didn't, they didn't check LP little a. But it would have been very interesting if they had went back and looked at those 100 people that had severe coronary artery disease that he put on a plant-based diet and did so well, how many of those guys actually had elevated LP little a. Because we know when you take the oil out of your diet and take uh, the animal products out of your diet, you decrease oxida oxidation substantially and you decrease in, in the gut microbe. That's the other aspect of this. 
Um, we know that the, the microbes in the gut of people eat animal products, uh, elevations of TMAO, uh, a, a lot of other different esters are very inflammatory, largely driven by their gut bacteria. So, you know, by changing the diet, we can not only decrease inflammation through what you eat, taking things out, but you're also changing your gut microbiome to decrease your total body inflammation. And I, and I really do think that that's where the money is as far as, especially in someone like you, that you had a little bit of an elevation of homocysteine at one point. Um, and and we, never, we never were able to document elevated inflammatory markers per se, but that was by the time I met you, you were actually on a plant-based diet. And- um, uh, Right, yeah, that's something I started the, uh, the day after I got home from the hospital. Um, I tried to start in the hospital, but uh, they wouldn't let me order extra vegetables and no meat. So <laughs> I had to wait till I got home. Uh, and it, the day I got home, I started it um, and had never looked back. Uh, we just went cold turkey, switched and cleaned out the pantry and cleaned out the freezer and went plant-based. So, you know, I got to ask you the question, uh, are you happy being plant-based? Yeah, I, I'm, I like the aspect of I feel well. Uh, and I think my wife feels good on the diet as well. Um, She's got a little bit more of a family history of, of heart disease than, than my side. So I, I think it's beneficial for her to be on the uh, plant-based diet. Um, and the only you know difficult times is uh, if you're going out somewhere, uh, especially if you're going out with a group, it's sometimes hard to uh, find something to eat or find a place to go and eat. Uh, but, but this past year, it's not been a problem because we're not going out to eat very much with this COVID thing. So, but uh, hopefully it'll change in the, in the future and uh, more and more places will start carrying plant-based options. Um, you know, certainly you can call ahead. I've done that calling ahead and, and finding out if they can offer something and most places do offer something if you uh, let them know in advance, that always helps. So tell me about the tent. What kind of food was in your tent during the race? Um, well, it wasn't just our tent that the, uh, the event offered food. So all the athletes or the support team could get food, um, uh, that was prepared, uh, by the, the event organizers. And, uh, there was, you know, the typical hamburgers and stuff like that. And then there was some kind of really sweet looking French toast or something for breakfast that kind of turned my stomach when I saw somebody eating it. But, uh, you know, I, I saw um, a lot of things, um, a, lot, a lot of your typical high sugar things were being consumed by many of the athletes. Um, and, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I, I put a, a peach on the table that I would run by and I would stop, take a couple of bites of the peach and then take off. And, and when I got back, one of the guys said, well, that was a pretty juicy peach. I bet that was good. And I said, yeah, it really was good. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I, I typically rely on uh, dates and fruit uh, during the event. Uh, between legs, uh, for my dinner, I had um, boiled potatoes and some soy curls, mm -hmm. uh, which was kind of nice. And I actually warmed them up on the top of my uh, fire engine. <laughs> <laughs> In true Mexican Florida fashion. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so overall, uh, I think I tried to eat as good as I could during the event. And, uh, you know, it's just unfortunate that so many folks uh, either don't have the knowledge or, or the desire to eat better than what they, they are. But uh, hopefully that knowledge will start, you know, being disseminated more and, and more and more people will start uh, taking an interest in what they eat and, and how it makes them feel, that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I always when I see the PSK8 inhibitor advertisements on TV, and there's this giant guy grilling hamburgers, and, you know, he's like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm protected because I'm on this injectable drug, and, you know, I want to scream at the TV, no, you're not, no, you're not, you know, <laughs> and, and, of course, the diabetics, you know, I've dropped my hemoglobin A1C, you know, and, but they're still look the part, and, you know, so they're out doing what they want, but their numbers got better, right, so everything and even as physicians, you know, we think that as long as the numbers look good, then we've done all we can do, so to speak. And, um, 
the newest therapy out for LP little a is actually, um, it is actually a gene modification type of drug. And that is really, to me, really, really scary. It's, it's called a, um, um, well, for the, for the most part, it's a bunch of, a bunch of letters, uh, but it's uh, a, a K C E A a po little a crx or another name is tqj 230 but it's a it's basically a gene delivered with a viral vector um so that your body it basically turns off uh the lp little a gene and it's in phase two trials now it's an injectable drug um and um you know, it, it, it alters your, it truly does. You know, we all, we, we argue back and forth about what COVID vaccine does, but this truly is something aimed at altering your DNA and, and getting rid of this nucleate or turning off this particular uh, nucleic acid sequence. And, you know, up until now, when that has happened, um, you know, there are turn, you know, we turn one thing off. The body's pretty smart turning one thing off, but it was really part of turning something else on or turning, you know what I mean? So it's, uh, to me, that's, that's really scary, especially since we don't know that if you decrease LP little a, it ultimately makes a difference because if lowering LP little a doesn't change the events, then what truly is the funk? There must be some positive function for LP little a in some individuals as well, or some, some need um, so that decreasing it in those particular interval individuals may backfire in the back in someplace else, you know, down the road. Um, you know, I, I liken it to APOE4 in, in, in dementia. You know, if you have one APOE4 gene, you have three times the risk of early onset dementia. If you have two, you have nine times the risk of the general population. But if you look at Nigerians, they, there's a very high rate of uh, having two APOE4 genes in the, in the Nigerian population and a very low rate of dementia. And so it's thought to be secondary to their dietary, you know, a, a lot of their diet that perhaps that whatever that interaction protects them, you know, just like, um, just, you know, just like in a sickle cell population, they happen to also be resistant to malaria. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So they're in a, in a population, you know, where we identify one factor is bad, sometimes there's a, there's a side to it that is actually protective in that population. And we don't know that yet. So I think that, you know, it comes back to, you can't, you can't necessarily outrun your genes. Uh, and maybe you can't out eat them either, but if you apply all those together, I think you have the best shot at doing very well um, and tackling things from a multifaceted aspect, as opposed to just take this medicine and go live your life and hope for the best. You know, so, um, and, and that, you know, that's kind of funny. That's, that's what uh, I was told. I, you know, first got out of the hospital and I went for my first follow-up with cardiologist. I, I inquired about uh, the benefits of a plant-based diet and uh, they kind of nodded and gave lip service. Yeah, it's important to eat well, but uh, take these medicines, you're gonna be on them for life kind of a thing. Um, so that was my first one. I tried another cardiologist and uh, pretty much got the same uh, story from them that uh, I should stay on the statins and uh, that there was uh, reduced risk with statins no matter where your cholesterol was. If you take statins, it can further reduce your risk and, and no real serious um, benefit given to a plant-based diet. And, uh, and, that, and after that is when uh, I started with you and that was you know late 2017. Yeah. So I, you know, I mean, I, I still, you know, I see, uh, you know, I've, I've had the, the, the privilege of watching people now that want to come to my practice, that they're seeking nutrition as a way to avoid medications and, and to reverse their disease. And, you know, I'm seeing the benefits of it. Um, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, people aren't having problems that are on the plant-based diet. And they're, these are people that have vascular disease you know they're they're doing they're doing well so i you know I, there has you know there, there definitely 
um, something to it. And, you know, when I was in pra a traditional cardiology practice and I was just using medications and suggesting people eat well, whatever that was at the time, um, you know, uh, I, I wasn't seeing that. And I, it, I had to laugh today because I, I got a note from a, a patient from a nephrologist and it went down all the things that the patient should do to protect his kidneys. And one of it was eat a low protein diet. And that was, that was basically what, you know, the notes said eat a low protein diet, which we know does protect the kidneys and decreases the risk of uh, progression to, to kidney failure. But when you tell somebody eat a low protein diet, I mean, that's the, even that is, you know, people would say, Oh, I, you know, why, why would I want to do that? You know, I thought you needed protein and, and what would that be, you know, to most people um, only because, you know, as a plant uh, based eater, you are eating a low protein diet. You're eating about 10% of your calories, 10, 15%, depending on how many calories you take in, but it's around 10, 15%. But, you know, if you told somebody on the standard American diet to eat a low protein diet, what, what would that be? You know, so it's, you know, so they, so we give lip service, exercise, eat a, eat a good diet, eat a healthy diet, eat a, you know, Mediterranean diet. There's, there's no country named Mediterranean. You know, the Greeks eat different from the Italians who eat different, you know, from the, the you know, so, I mean, there's, there, there's a lot of variety in the Mediterranean area as far as what people eat. So what do you pick, you know? Um, you pick what was in Time Magazine, perhaps, you know, <laughs> and so it, it, you know, I, it, it can get, you know, very, very confusing. But, you know, I think, you know, again, hats off to you and your team. Anybody on your team, look at what you eat and say, hmm. Yeah, well, they knew going in that I ate differently than they did, <laughs> so. Uh... We, you know, we had support people around the clock. We had a couple of folks from the, the club volunteer to support us. So one of them were, was always in the tent area and their uh, job was to make sure we had whatever we wanted out for food. Uh, if we wanted to change bottles, they would do that, um, that sort of thing. And uh, when they asked me about that, I said, I'll have everything in my cooler and, you know, I'll, I'll let you know what it is that I want. And just, just put it on the table and I'll take care of it. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, they, they knew it was uh, going to be different than their normal gels and power bars and things like that. So, uh, but uh, that, that's okay. I, I'm used to it. <laughs> uh, I'm certainly in the minority, but uh, I'd rather be in minority and, and feel the way I do and, and be off of the medications than to, uh, to eat like everyone else. Well, I actually read um, a study that where well, it was a, actually a more of a commentary uh, looking at, you know, do we eat eggs or is eggs, are eggs bad? Is red meat bad? Because some days it is and sometimes it isn't and people get very confused. And, you know, one study says yes. And of course the plant-based people say, well, yes, that was backed by the egg people or the dairy industry or the meat industry. And typically they were, but you know, is there any validity to any of these things? And one of the commentaries that I think brought up a great thing, it's like really just about not much more than 1% of the population actually gets the adequate, the, the number of fruits and vegetables, just the RDA. So if you just look at the, you know, the lowest threshold, the American, you know, standard re re registered or dietetic association recommended daily fruits and vegetables, only 1% of the population actually gets that low standard. And so when you look at things like eggs or meat, if everybody's eating poorly, you know, what caused the problem on the sausage egg McMuffin? Was it the egg? Was it the sausage? Was it the muffin? You know, how would you tell which one caused, you know, which one did me in, right? Uh, right. I always laugh when people, you know, throw carbs under the bus and I'll say, well, what's chocolate cake? Is it a carb? Is it a protein? Is it a fat? You know, but the reality of it is, so there's so many people that eat so poorly in this country that you can't really tell in essence what's what bad foods worse. But if you go and look at the Mediterranean uh, area where people tend to eat more fish and less fast foods and, you know, some oil, but more vegetables, then you can start to see, hey, those people that eat eggs over there, one egg a week gives those people diabetes. 
you know, so you can start to tease out some of those, you know, uh, the red meat, everything starts to, those things start to rear their ugly head when you have a population that you can actually see a difference in a little bit. So I thought that was a really interesting point. So not only as plant-based eaters are we in the minority, but we're really in the minority when it comes down to just healthy eating, you know, and, and exercise. So yes, you're on an island, <laughs> but you know, it's uh, hopefully it's an island full of you know healthy people. But um, so anyway, it was well, it was great. I congratulate you again. You know, you're now you're giving me the bug to do triathlon. We haven't done triathlon since Chattanooga. Really? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we did the swim run, but I haven't, I haven't been on my bike. I just walked by it in the bedroom, you know, I just have uh, been ignoring it for the most part because we've been running to train for ultras and did the swim run. So, you know, now I've gotten the bug again for this. So thanks a lot. Well, good. Yeah, after Chattanooga, I actually went down to Miami for the uh, Miami Man, and that was a um, national qualifier for long course. And I was able to uh, qualify for Team USA down there and I uh, was supposed to go to uh, ITU Worlds last year, but it was canceled because of COVID. So that's on my calendar for this year in September in Almira, Netherlands, if they have it, which I hope they do. It's, you know, we're still six months or so out. So hopefully things get better out there and uh, we can have the event. Um, Cause that'll be my first time uh, at a world championship event like that. So I'm looking forward to it. And it's, it's going to be long course distance of a full iron. So wow. uh, ITU long course varies between about a half iron distance and a full iron distance, depending on who's promoting, putting on the race. And, and this is a challenge event over there. So the challenge the company. Um, and so they're putting on a full. And in conjunction with the Worlds, they also have an open full uh, for the general population. And that, that's already sold out. So we'll see how it goes. My, my biggest concern is the uh, water temperature. Yes. It's supposed to be in the low 60s, which is awful cold for someone who's been in Florida for almost 40 years. <laughs> I got to tell you, the swim run that we did, the water was in the high 60s, and I was ready to get out. We had a short wetsuit on, but, you know, I mean, you could feel it. Uh, you know, it took a while when you got out to warm up, especially after the first one and the first swim in the morning. You yeah. know, it, it was, uh, I, I was shivering and, and cold and I was, you know, I was thankful to have be running in a wetsuit, um, <laughs> trying to warm up a little bit before you had to get in again, you know? So yeah, yeah for us Floridians, that cold weather, you're going to start doing some ice plunges or something, you know, ice baths to try to get, get, get ready. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was, I've got plans to, uh, talk with one of our team members here. He's from Norway. And uh, he's done a lot of cold water swimming. So he's, he said he'll help me out and help me get prepared for that uh, and let me know what I should be doing, what to expect. So that, that'll be interesting. Uh, swimming is my weakest of the three events by far. Uh, so if I get through the swim over there, I'll, I'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, you can uh, put a snowsuit on for the bike and try to warm up until you get to <laughs> <laughs> Well, Tom, I, I do appreciate you taking time to speak with me. And again, congratulations. I, I couldn't be more proud to have you as part of the practice. And, uh, you know, you're an inspiration for all of us. And keep it up. Well, thank you. And, and give some thoughts to a plant-based striders team for the uh, 22 uh, double anvil up here. Well, you know what? It could happen. It could happen. We have a whole year to prepare, right? Yeah. God, uh, you know, when Michael listens to this podcast, I know I'm in deep, deep trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> You're welcome. Bye-bye. All right. Have a good evening. What? Plant-based striders? Double anvil? Yeah, maybe. Could happen. Got to swim, run for the fall. Might as well put a bike in there. Tom's definitely given me the desire to get back on my bike rather than just walk by it. Um, we've been running and swimming so much. So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Tom. Takeaways, you know, you can always get a little bit better, adjust things, train for something. Um, don't, little, don't let a little genetics get in your way uh, of having a good time. So thank you for listening. As always, if you have questions about our practice, you can go to drdelaney.com and find out 
how you can become a member of our practice, D-O-C-T-O-R-D-U-L-A-N-E-Y. You can go over to Plant Based Striders and join our run group on Facebook. It's just a virtual group that uh, people post what they've been doing, help motivate each other and plant-based, throw through recipes on there and talk about, show some pictures of where you're running and what you're training for. So thank you again for listening and I'll be speaking with you next week. Run long, bike strong.